This is Philosophy versus Improv, where two sages try to teach each other a thing or two, and maybe you, the audience, get something out of it as well. I'm Mark Lintonmeyer, a philosophy-centered individual who has come here today to learn improv. And I'm Bill Arnett, an improv-centered individual coming to discuss philosophy. And hey, we have our first guest, a guest judge, but a fully interactive participant. Introduce yourself. I am Tim Sniffen, a fully interactive participant, ready to respond to whatever needs may come my way. And, and also, in these two worlds, I would definitely fall more in the world of improv, perhaps a journeyman improviser. I dare to call myself a contemporary of Bill's, but by no means an equal in accomplishment or knowledge. Oh, please. Please. Our accomplishments and knowledge are in magnitude amazing, yet perhaps not a lot of overlap. Agreed. I'll, I will <laughs> take your lessons and agree. And I understand there's some uh, Midwest, East Coast school competition. Is that right? Or you're an ex-Midwest, now East Coast, Tim? Oh, I'm full Midwest, like in the Chicago, New York, whatever the imagined rivalry is. I probably would fall in the school of Chicago, but I've done my handful of shows in New York. I was able to adapt, I like to think. Well, you're not in Chicago anymore, so you are a traitor. Fair enough. <laughs> we just need to generate some conflict. The people love it. <laughs> we're losing people right now. There's a whole lot of hatred in the room, so we're getting them back. The format of this is at least two of us have come with a lesson in mind that we want to, in some way, in the next half hour or so, impart to the others on the call. We're not going to take turns doing this. We're not going to say what the lesson is up front. And at the end, Tim will decide whether the improv lesson or the philosophy lesson has produced the most profound effect on all concerned. Whatever tools you need, do you have your uh, e-meter, you have your uh, kilobyte duster. What, what is your favorite uh, tool for detecting the amount of impact that a lesson has had? I'm going to go with the classic bag of chicken bones. I'm just going to scatter them on the ground and see what they tell me. Okay, sounds good. All right, I believe it's my turn to start. It is. So I'll just say what my topic is. In general, I'll throw out a question, and then... If you guys want to start a scene based on it, say, for instance, maybe, Bill, you can launch us. Miracles. Do you believe in miracles? Okay. Do you know what the ancients have said about miracles? All the ancients. Okay. All right. Do you want to dive in now or do you want to discuss miracles? However, <laughs> well, let's do this. You know, to kind of perhaps marry miracles into what my topic is, which I will not share, at least not yet. Having a third person with some improv chops is just begging to do an improv scene with the three of us. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to know, Tim, I've been working with Mark pretty good now for the last eight or 10, 12 weeks. This is episode 16, just so you know. He's making 16? <laughs> well, some of them are punts. Let's just be perfectly okay. honest. Some of them, we just, we're just tire spinning, slowly sliding backwards, trying to rock that car out of the snowbank uh, with limited degrees of success. I want to try something here with three people. Sometimes when you start doing improv with more than two people, there can be issues. There can be problems. And I think, Mark, if you're going to be a sharp player, you need to be ready to be in three-person scene. Sounds good. That was certainly the intention. There's a little trick to it. And I don't mean to put Tim on the spot or you on the spot too much, Mark, than you already are. But I might need to speak second or third to illustrate a little truth and a little trick that I think will make this go easily. All right, then I nominate Tim to go first. <laughs> well, doctors, uh, we all witnessed what just happened in there. Yeah, that was odd. Yeah, I, I, I didn't see anything unusual. Really? Hmm. I, uh, it seemed like a, a perfectly normal kind of procedure. I'd, um, I just need a minute. Including the flash of light that yeah. felt very just every day. From the light from the man's chest. That was yeah, normal. Yeah. Directly from the chest. I guess I was a little distracted. I just, I, I assumed that this, this must be something that, uh, we we're all having a time. I mean, it was a, there was a lot of stress in the room. There was, uh, mm -hmm. things going on and, uh, uh, okay. I didn't find it normal. I didn't find it normal. I'm going to go on record saying that was strange. Thank you. That was odd. I, in the light, I believe I saw the face of my deceased mother. Okay. I don't know if any of you saw anything in that light. That's what I saw in that quick flash. Crazy, because what I saw 
was the face of my best friend growing up, Scotty. Oh I know who fell into a ravine and was and we and it's dead. You know, it's dead. You saw a dead face. That's what dead. we're getting. He, he was looking right back at me. Wow. Wow. Did he say something? Did he say something? I, I might. I, I didn't see anything. I, you I need heard more. Some you, you need more. I heard. I, is that going to change your opinion on what happened? I, is the the dialogue? He did say something. He looked at me and he said, "It's going to be okay." And did he look like he looked when he died, or did he look like uh, what he would look like? When did he die? Was it a long time ago? I have to ask, are you fact checking what I just saw in there? I mean, we were all in the room. I didn't see that. I, I heard some things that I assume is just my own, you know, uh, defense mechanism. What did you hear? I, clearly, we witnessed a third party out of body experience. I mean, the guy's vitals dipped right at that moment before they came back. So clearly, this was a connection kind of a thing. And if you heard anything, I think you should share it. I think you have a medical responsibility to record what you saw back there. Again, I didn't see anything, but I heard a voice that sounded a lot like Jim Henson. I, you know, doing the Kermit voice, I said he had some stuff to get off his chest, said something about buried gold. I didn't really catch all the details, but I just assumed that this is just me. You know, this is just my imagination spinning. It's funny that all three of us did this. I got to assume that it's maybe something in the lunch from earlier from Sparrow. Why are you fighting this? Some uh, hallucinogenic uh, pepperoni kind of stuff. I don't know. I didn't. Did you have the pepperoni? Now, we all went to medical school and we all learned. Do you not first look at what's right in the room with you for explanations? Or are you going to look for some wild, unconnected bit of evidence like what we all ate? We all just saw something. I'm going to say supernatural. This is a huge overlap in the medical community. And I think we have to be honest with each other. It's just that the reason that we believe in science is because of decades, centuries now of of reliable testimony. And uh, when something like this happens that seems to fly completely in the face of expected uh, causal mechanisms, wouldn't the the prior, even though it's, yes, immediate first-person experience, it seems like the weight of that prior, you know, more likely, since we know about times where people are fooled by, well, something they ate, a bad bit of beef. You're just tap dancing right now, okay? <laughs> this was not what, this was a corroborate, this is a single incident with three witnesses, okay? Not to mention, I don't know, I haven't talked to the nurses yet. I have no idea if they saw anything, all right? This was not just some standalone thing, all right? Many of them fled, and I can't believe that was some agreed upon fire drill. Like they fled the room. That's like the number one thing you're not supposed to do as a nurse. I haven't closed in five years. I usually hand that off to the assistant. So there was. I thought, I, I thought I did OK. And I thought it, I did OK. It, for being it a was touch and go. It was touch and go. There was a part that was still open. Granted, we had all been through a lot. And I was like, I still if this were a bicycle tire, I think there'd be a slow leak. But then you finished it off. I have to say you came back. You landed the plane. Look, I mean, they're just. The guy's 68. He's getting Frankenstein stitches. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I agree. I, I, sp- I mean, over 50, I think it's fair to, you know, do most of this at like 75%. We don't need to call in the plastic surgeon to, to close if, if this person's older. But what we're talking about, Mark, is your inability to accept the spiritual nature of what we all witness. I, first of all, I'd prefer Dr. Mark. Don't just call me by my last name by itself. Okay. All right. Okay. I think we can, we're all on a, we're on more than a first name basis right now. After what we witnessed at this point, I think uh, we need to retreat to our professional capacities and uh, try to be objective about this. Apparently you saw one face. You saw another face. I saw no face. All we can agree upon is that there was a light and that some messed up stuff happened. It's not easy. Being green is still in my head. That's the data. We, what I, does I, that mean to you? What does that mean to you? And did you hear what words you just used? Did you hear when you said retreat? When do you retreat in a battle when you're frightened, when you're frightened of what's right in front of you? You're saying you were not frightened by what just happened there? You're saying that the foundations of, of uh, your practice being shaken does not uh, cause you a little bit of a uh, pause? Okay, I think we're all just leaving a lot on the table today. Can I share that? I've been waiting for something like this. Most nights I pray for it. Give me a sign that there's more than this crude medicine that I know. I feel strangely at ease right now. Wow, bring it in. Bring it in. That was, I'd be lying if I didn't say my mother said nothing, but she just had that look. 
that look and that nod of like, it's, you're fine. You're doing great. And I'm proud. And I'm proud. It sounds like words would have been overkill with a look Uh, like that. How how do you, (laughs) I mean, picture's worth a thousand words. And in that brief, I don't know, microsecond, I I don't know, (sighs) flood of emotion. It's good to know that I think in the future, I'm ready to tell patients, I might heal whatever's wrong with you or magical powers that we don't really understand might intervene and also set this right. I think it's great to be able to offer that option to them. And during your surgery, if you are to flatline, let me just say this, I will remain calm and look for supernatural moments before resuscitating to give you the chance to perhaps see the warm glow that I saw. How reassuring. I how, like how reassuring that would be to hear just before surgery. Yeah, that you won't be resuscitated right away if you die. And like anything could happen in there. We're just going to ride it out. <sighs> this is medicine. I think I have a way to settle this, which is I'm kind of remembering a little more clearly where uh first of all, I I always felt like the muppets were talking directly to me. So this could explain the uh the resonance of that particular image, but Jim Henson as the voice of Kermit did say specifically that his his gold was buried under the Hardee's on 42nd Street. So if you'll just go with me uh, with some shovels, dig up under the Hardee's. If we find the, the gold there, then I will go on record. We could write a paper together on the existence of miracles, and that's cool. Otherwise, uh, I think it's a bunch of bullshit. Under the Hardee's. Yes, on 42nd and and 3rd. Not the one on 42nd all the way down, down downtown. This is like under. This is up. New York City? That's like an 11-hour drive. We're going to go there and look for gold? When? Tonight? You don't want to look up for Kermit's gold? We you don't live think- in Raleigh. We're in Raleigh. You, you want us to drive to New York because Jim Henson told you? Noted Christian scientist, which I, I mean, I'm drinking in the irony of that, appeared to you from the afterworld and told you to look for Buried gold under New York? Is this a sequel to The Goonies? So your bullshit is okay, but my bullshit is unbelievable. Okay, It's it's your willingness, your willingness to drive to New York City and dig up under a Hardee's demonstrates to me that you were impacted heavily. Yeah, I I probably will never practice medicine again. I, I have no, this was not a positive thing. You put on this dismissive facade, but clearly you were deeply impacted. And... Trying to cut us out of getting the gold, if I'm not mistaken. (laughs) I I mean, until we get there, I was not going to make that decision. But I mean, if you're going to force it on me, yeah, I need I need some arms. I need some shovels. But uh, this was my vision. I think I should get at least a higher percentage. You know what? Never mind. There was no gold. I'm just going to I'm going to cut out of here and uh, we'll see you later. I'm I'm leaving medicine. But uh, you guys have fun with your uh, life changing affirmations. You can have all the gold. You find under Hardy's. I'm going to give that to you. I, you can have it all. I got a gift far more valuable than any Hardy's gold. And scene. Perfect. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. That was fun. <gasps> that was. I thought Mark did a fine job. Now, Mark, I have to ask you, and Tim might know the answer or have a, a variation on the answer. Or a an opinion on the variation of an answer. Mark, did you see the, the choice I made? Were you cognizant of the choice I made? So Tim initiated, and then you were, you were going with it, uh, and I decided not to. Sure. What does that create? Well, it was ganging up. That's, we've had our first instance of ganging up here. I, I don't like the word ganging up. <laughs> we can talk about that later. But I may let the cat out of the bag a little bit here. How many points of view were in that scene, Mark? I guess only two, even though it seemed like there were three. Yeah, it's essentially two. And I think w- one of the big lessons as we go forward in our improv journey is that it's not the number of actors that make scenes confusing, but the numbers of points of view. And if we can limit the points of view, well, then we all know we have an easier time to see how those points of view interact. As the scene, If the scene were going longer, perhaps Tim and I would diverge or something would happen between us or something different. But especially at the beginning, especially up top, perhaps it would be in our best interest to limit P's OV If that makes sense. Well, that's a great way. We're concerned about introducing a guest into this dynamic. And the fact that both of you are are from the improv world. Tim does not know your lesson in advance, but presumably you're both from the same Chicago style school. And so it's not going to be those New Yorkers that are going to come in and say, oh, you know, improv is just saying, 
How you doing? Get out of my face. I'm walking here. That that's what I hear that the UCB people are all about. The big difference is it's of similar improv scenes and rules, but you know that industry is watching. Whereas in Chicago, it's your friends that you have bullied into coming to the show or whoever's waiting to do the next show. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I would probably say if industry's in the house, those players praying for a miracle. <laughs> Even, what are we, 15 minutes in? That's our show, folks. So, so <laughs> yeah. It seems like a good time to stop and do our ad reads. Why don't you do yours, Bill? You know, week after week, entering the debate ring with Mark and consistently destroying him, I have become concerned for Mark's mental health, stress, depression, anxiety. I'm sure these are all things that trouble Mark weekly after our trouncing sessions. Well, thanks to COVID, so much of our lives have moved online. And with our sponsor today, BetterHelp.com, professional counseling has moved online too. Uh, BetterHelp is not self-help. It's not a crisis line. It's professional counseling. It's online. It's secure. They'll consider your needs and match you with a licensed professional in 48 hours. You can send messages anytime and get thoughtful, timely responses. There's no waiting rooms or it's convenient and it's affordable and it's on your schedule. And since it's online, it's available worldwide. BetterHelp.com. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com. And thanks to them for sponsoring this program and actually offering a 10% off promo code, BetterHelp.com slash improv. So if you, like Mark, are experiencing stress, depression, anxiety, such common in this day and age, head on over to BetterHelp.com. Thanks, Bill. St. John's College is for undergraduate and graduate students who seek meaning in their lives, who ask hard questions of themselves and their world, and who dare to free their minds. In small discussion-based classes, students grapple with fundamental questions that confront us as human beings and engage with influential works by some of the world's greatest writers and thinkers, from Homer, Plato, and Euclid to Nietzsche, Einstein, Wolf, and Baldwin. This strong commitment to collaborative inquiry and to the study of original texts makes St. John's College a particularly vibrant community of learning, where students participate in lively discussions and immerse themselves in translating, writing, demonstrating, conducting experiments, and analyzing musical compositions. Through this, they learn to listen deeply and across perspectives and to speak and reason with precision. Explore 3,000 years of human thought in just four years or two for graduate students on campuses in Santa Fe, New Mexico and Annapolis, Maryland. Learn about our undergraduate and graduate great books programs, including online graduate options at sjc.edu slash improv. What did you learn about what thoughts came up about miracles and their evidence and legitimacy? Tim, start us. Was anything informative in there or were we just playing with common ideas? Something that I've just thought about recently, which I found myself thinking about during that scene was the function that miracles serve for people. Like the fact that regardless of what happened in that room, we now have that to believe in that seems to take on a life of its own. I thought it was interesting in like whether it really happened or not, if these people are going to change the way they practice medicine, it seems like there's two things that you're dealing with actual miracles and the ripple effects of miracles or the belief in miracles that will change someone's life. It almost doesn't matter if the miracle happened or not. So that was on my mind because I thought my character did believe they saw what they saw, but who knows what that means? There's no way to recreate it. And I thought, wow, like I love the idea of like, he's probably going to be a terrible doctor now because he has no faith. He has no belief, no hard, unquestioning belief in science. It's very, eh, it's all up for grabs now. Who knows? Like it's, so he's probably, his career is ruined. And he was liberated by that too, which is even more ironic. He, prefers to be this bad doctor this <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's interesting that it didn't make anyone better that bill was putting forward this we're gonna let you stay dead longer to have these experiences which i thought was a high point and my character certainly was not at least there was a testing mechanism there are a number of ways i could have gone with that as the skeptic of well open them up again Let's recreate it. Let's do something. Like, wait, get another <laughs> guy in here. Uh, hey, why don't you, Tim, you get down the table. We're going to, we're going to open you up in that same way. I think it had something to do with exactly what valve you cut and we got to, you know, create, um, some sort of light effect and some sort of sprayed hallucinogenic gas. Clearly that was what was going on, but finding Jim Henson's gold under the hearty seemed, uh, you know, just the more obvious choice. I think it's certainly there is a heaviness to miracles. 
there is a personal aspect to these things. You know, what would you call a miracle if you had hard evidence? Would it still be miraculous? Like, that was amazing. You know, it's like someone, your child's under a car and they just lift the car up, you know, and kick their kid out. You know, it's amazing. But if you got that on videotape, would you still call it a miracle? Or does it have to be, does it have to have some kind of mysterious nature? It does seem to rely on no explanation, I would think. If you're really going to call it a miracle instead of just like an extraordinary event, it seems like part of that is a mystery. Like, we don't know how it happened, but it did happen. If it had an explanation, well, we just use the explanation. I feel like in the classic presentations of religious miracles, they think they have an explanation. Jesus is God and did it. There you go. That's the explanation. What else do you want? Like, it's not like you have a great, especially at the time where those things were going around. If you're like, I made a quiche and it look how light and fluffy it got. It's a miracle because you can't explain chemically at that point in history why the quiche got light and fluffy. So that's just as mysterious as Jesus is turning water into wine. Maybe he just had the reagent. He had the, the powdered wine. Well, I mean, if all of their quiches were terrible and then one was great, that, I think that would be miraculous. But I'm not, not aware of anybody. If a race of aliens contacted us and as we got to know them said, yeah, we sent one of our kind here a long time ago. You would have known him as Jesus. And we have an ability to transform matter and to appear dead and to duplicate loaves and fishes. I think people would probably be pretty upset if it were like, here's exactly how all of that was done. I don't think religious people would be excited about that. It would be like, it would be disappointing. Like, no, no, no. I just, I want it to just work because my faith makes it so. They might even refuse to believe. They were, the, the flying saucer lands, six or eight aliens come out and they all turn loaves into fishes. It's just like, look, it's, it's these, just, you know, shake them out of your sleeve. I think the people would like, no, 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 no. This is the devil tempting us. Right. They would kill, they would eventually kill, kill that alien, alien yes. <laughs> again. It would be like, well, we've seen this storyline play <laughs> yeah. out. We're not Wait visiting this planet anymore. The Christians yet again killed someone who makes loaves and fishes. Uh, <laughs> if we had solid evidence of something like this happening in first person, that would lead to the data on which science would be founded, right? The whole idea is that a scientific regularity is just one that we've just seen a bunch of times. So if you actually witness a new thing happening, yeah, of course you're maybe going to look for other explanations, but like, it seems like that primary experience should feed directly into creating new generalizations. But yet that doesn't seem to be what happens. Why do you think that might be? The whole idea that science is a thing is relatively new in human history. And the whole notion of like thinking and that, hey, even though some things are hot and some things are cold, that's only like 3,000 years old. And even then it didn't catch on right away. So in a mindset where there is no science and that the world just does what the world does, I think people are probably more likely to be awed and assign causality to just this amazing nature that we live in. As today, when we're just we all understand what science is and the scientific method, and we all get it, and we all live our lives this way, and logic is a thing. So when something does happen, we're probably programmed to a degree to, well, there's, I'm sure there's a logical explanation for all of this. Is, I don't know if it's a Western disease or, a, or even if it's a disease or a, a human thing now, but the fact that miracles were more common in the ancient world kind of makes sense. Well, and if they were more common, you might just be like, oh, okay. I would think that maybe ancient people, some of them would just, if they really believe these stories, as opposed to them just being stories, then they would just be like, ah, oh, another one of those. Well, you know, as Tim said, does the miracle matter does the, if it changes the person? I think especially in ancient times where, you, you know, there were more miracles or somehow they were easier to believe. I think just the comfort they provided, you know, if something really bad happens to me, there's always this magical option where it's going to be fixed. So that provides a lot of hope. And someone might be more willing to like leave the house every day if they're like, well, if I am truly in danger, something from the sky will intervene or, you know, some thing will happen to make it not hurt me. There's that effect and that ongoing constant belief that they provide. Whereas if you had scientific evidence of like, well, that one time that boulder turned into ash as it was rolling down the hill towards our village. That was because it was actually had an icy core and it got superheated as it passed over a very blah, blah, blah. If you knew that and it was like the conditions for that don't exist anymore, that will never happen again. If one of those boulders comes loose, it's absolutely crushing us. You would live in terror or you would at least think there's nothing is going to save me from that this time. 
you probably wouldn't want that knowledge. Yeah, and and uh, I have nothing to add, but I do have a question. <laughs> I'm presuming many of the philosophers, ancient and otherwise, ancient and modern, and in between, are probably more prone to scientific methods and whatnot, and that any philosopher who gives any legitimacy to miracles might be easily discredited. Right. Philosophy is a tendency towards systemization, right? Systemization of knowledge. So science is born out of philosophy, whether you have particular scientific method or not. But I think we're kind of pointing out in some of these examples with the boulder and we've got our vision of the world and then something happens that doesn't fit with that. And there just always seems to be room. Like you could even just, I know there must be some logical explanation. I just don't know it. I'm just going to admit it that it's an anomaly. You know, we'll call it a UFO. We'll call it an unidentified rolling boulder. We don't know exactly why that thing, particular thing happened, but it somehow works out. Or if you've already got a system in which gods punish us and reach down and help us when the boulder's about to smash, then you'll give an interpretation along those lines. And in fact, the mystical experience that we had, I think it's pretty well documented. You know, if you're super Christian and you have a mystical experience, you take a bunch of LSD or you meditate a lot or whatever, it gets you to that point that you have the flash of light and you have, you probably don't suddenly become a Muslim. You interpret it, whatever happened to your brain, according to the system that you've already got going, right? According to the mythology that you already have in your head. The Prophet Muhammad did. He became a Muslim. I, I, I guess you're right. Immediately, in fact, the first one. The first one, he said, I am the first Muslim. I'm sure that is right in the, in the scripture. <laughs> you know what? If we can do another, if we have time for another improv scene, Mark, Maybe Tim and I can start this thing, and then you can decide to either join in with a point of view of one of us or take your own. All right. How does that, how does that sound? And I will say, this is something with teaching improv, being able to look at a scene, look at a moment, see what a behavior is, and be able to mimic that behavior or mimic that point of view demonstrates that you understand it. Does that make sense? And even if in a two-person scene, just this whole notion of being able to think about behaviors and think, so, think about points of view, as a teacher, it's good for me to say, to get a piece of glass in the pipe, to be able to look inside and see that this person's process is like, yeah, they adequately or accurately distilled that and figured it out. So this time, you get to be under the microscope here, Mark. I will get under there for a limited period of time. Just as a <laughs> clock watcher, I'm saying this is not going to be a 15-minute scene. <laughs> All right. Tim and I will get to get that. That's at nine minutes, I'm out. Okay. <laughs> I don't care if we finally found the heart of it. I'm just. All right. Uh, sir, I'm sorry. I just looked, I looked all through the restaurant. I didn't find a, a doll or a kid's bag or anything. I'm, I'm just, I'm real sorry. Where in the restaurant could it be then? Do you have people that come through and maybe would have taken the doll and would have hidden it somewhere else? Uh, <laughs> it's just my daughter. I mean, you can see her look through the window. She's right there in the car. Uh, I, I can look again. People are picking up oh, chairs right now. They're putting chairs on tables. If it were here, I really think we would have come across it. All right. Dad, did you find the, did they find the doll? Well, he's saying he won't look hard enough, honey. So, um. That's not very nice. You should look harder, sir. That's not what I said. I didn't say I won't look hard enough. I'm, I'll check again one second. In fact, I'm just going to go run over to. Could I quickly, uh, if I could just have a moment of your time, I thought uh, maybe you understood the importance of this, but I'm realizing I haven't said enough. We don't really understand it, but when she's holding that doll, her IQ triples. I've just gotten her registered into one of the most prestigious academies in the country. And if she doesn't have that doll, I don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot to unpack in that. Sure. When I have that doll, I could do trigonometry. Okay. Uh, I, and hearing. I, I hearing. Can, is, I can do it. I could do it two ways. I could do the sine and the cosine. But you hear her stumbling over the sentence the way she just did. She doesn't do that when she has the and doll. She didn't even mention tangents. I know. She. You can see there might be some residual effects of the doll that are wearing off with the super hearing. Look, I'm a parent too, and I get it. And, oh, and congratulations. Kids, so I'm, I'll check again. I'm going to go talk to... Talk to Charlene here. She's in charge of the late night staff. Here. And this was a congratulatory dinner for her getting into the academy. I just, I sure. had to have the doll with us so you can understand for the evening to end this way. We, we got to find that thing. Well, I go and look, maybe you could uh, entertain the thought that maybe you lost it somewhere else. I'm just going to ask you to just entertain that thought. I'm going to step away. Daddy, just think about that. Dad, Daddy, when I, when the waiter was waiting on us, it seemed like I could see his motives and that he was a shifty fellow, but then I put the doll down and it was all dark to me. So 
honey, first of all, I just want to say something right away. No matter what you can do or whether we ever find that doll, I love you just the way you are. I always have. But now let's get back to this waiter that it sounds like maybe stole your doll. Did you see him take it? I didn't see him take it, but I knew from looking at his eyes that he had had some sort of shiftiness in his past and that he wasn't a very nice person. And then I, some of the food was kind of cold. And so he was very slow. Yeah. Sorry. We didn't, we we couldn't find it. There's a good chance that it'll get found later on tonight. I think we've got a, we're doing our deep clean tonight, our monthly deep clean, and we've got a lost and found bin. You want to give us a call in the morning? That'd be great. So you haven't found it now, but you want me to just march out of here and out of your life trusting that you're going to look for it harder when we're not here. We're closed. We've been closed. Uh, We've got people here who are going to be ready to go home soon. Can I explore Uh, one more line of thought before we get in the car and drive away? Sure. I'm hearing from my daughter that it sounds like you maybe employ some kind of unsavory characters. And I just want to know how people get hired here. If it's like, go ahead, honey. And I I didn't think of this at the time, but now that I don't have the doll, I think it's probably the ethnic background of the people that you hire. I think that's definitely relevant. Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, I'm sorry this went that way. You can see without the doll, she's like a little rough around the edges. She's also had the doll for a long time. So I haven't, I don't know this person very well. Okay. Well, I don't know where she learned that from either, but it's certainly not on Sesame Street. All right. Well, if you're implying my parenting, I mean, granted, I've been pretty much raising a different child for the last uh, five or so years. He let me watch The Wire. But now that I don't but have that the doll was when anymore, you had the doll. That's when you had like the doll. It was telling me that drugs are cool and that I should start dealing in the corner. This is the kind of opinions I'm going to be dealing with for the rest of my life if we can't find that doll. Well, hey, don't start on the wire unless you can finish the whole thing. It's an arc, okay? And there's going to be some mixed messages. With the doll, she saw where it was headed after season two. She explained it to me. Did you check on the street? Did you but on the walk on the, the little the patio area between the parking lot and here? Did you check there? Is it in the car? Did it fall under the under the car seat, under the passenger seat, under the driver's seat? Okay, before you list all the places that aren't this restaurant, she had the doll when you brought out that cake with the candle in it. She let she made it look like the doll blew out the candle with her. So let's abandon that whole line of inquiry. It's somewhere in here. I'm hearing we're not going to get into the waiter's ethnic background, but I'm hearing that you had a shady waiter. And I would love it if you could maybe figure out who that was. We can look at the the receipt and figure out who the, your server was. But I, I I don't think, I mean, A, we're not hiring Harvard graduates to serve. Let's just be perfectly. That's a shame. What a shame. They're going to take that job? Is that what you, you're, you're, if your daughter finds her doll and gets into that prestigious academy, how would you feel if she's serving, serving at the Red Robin? How, how, how would that, would that she wouldn't, well, she wouldn't need to, though. I feel like she would understand the common man's experience at that point, where she could then be using her intelligence to aid humanity in some greater way. Do you really need her to have that, you know, minimum wage job after Harvard? I tell you what, I clock out in eight minutes. The three of us can walk around this restaurant. We can go to the restroom. We can go to the bus station, busing station. But you'll be off the clock then? Do you, are you required to tell the truth when you're off the clock? Huh? Why are you off the clock? Why did you? I don't understand. So you're going to do this when you're not working? So I can go home. Okay. So you're not going to help us look for it I am going to help you for eight minutes, seven and a half minutes. Can can I just ask? I just found in my pocket this time-controlled safe of some sort. It looks like it's ticking down. It just has a few seconds left. Oh, and it's open. And and now I have the doll. I had put it in there earlier with its protective shell. So that I could see from the point of view of the common man. And now I see that that was a, a terrible attitude to want to incorporate. And it was very racist and it, it was very suspicious. I'm so sorry, sir, that we uh, imputed these terrible motives to your, your staff. And now I understand what the other side. Wow. A little bit of Dallas ex machina here, huh? I would love to introduce you to my daughter. It's nice to meet you. You will be working for me before too long. And scene. <laughs> okay, let's well, stop <not> there. <laughs> <laughs> well, bonus lesson, dealing with unsavory topics. <laughs> uh, I, I think that was, it was properly generic enough <laughs> to gesture at the unsavory topic without us actually being accused of... If you acknowledge it, 
and acknowledge that it's inappropriate, you'd be surprised what you can get away with. <laughs> I don't mean it like that, but one would be surprised. Yes. It didn't make me nervous because it was framed as an awful opinion. You know, the, <laughs> the, the performers were not presenting it as like, here's something we agree with. It was like, this is bad. No one should think this. I liked it because I was like, oh, wow, without this doll, this child turns into a monster. <laughs> we need to find this thing. <laughs> so, Bill, I was trying to be on Tim's team there. Sure. But you guys created too interesting a situation. And so I had to very quickly, I don't know, I think it was only a couple lines where I was being entirely in agreement. I violated the spirit of the... Uh, you didn't violate it at the beginning. And like I mentioned, as the scene goes on, it's going to have a life of its own. It's going to go where it goes. And as long as we can get our footing, a, a sound footing up top, boy, it's easy to then, if you want to throw an olive in that martini, we got a nice glass full of vodka and a whisper of vermouth. And if you want to be that olive, go for it. And I thought, if anything, when you mentioned <laughs> your little racist bent. It certainly got Tim and I on the same team at that point. And I was like, yeah, we do have to find this. But at that point, all the specifics were there. The foundation was built. It's hard to fail at that point. So you can do crazy stuff at that point. It is interesting that you didn't just bill your character, denounce what this fellow was saying as obvious nonsense. You know, obviously a child's IQ cannot change with this, that it seems the natural response to a craziness like that is merely to not be just, okay, I'm joining with you to try to find the doll, but yeah, this is a bunch of garbage. I got to get rid of this person as quickly as possible. As we discussed last week, when I intentionally followed you into accepting a crazy notion, yet could still be against the implications of your crazy notion for all, any viewers or listeners, I want to make sure they reference last week. This week, I wanted to make sure in this exercise that I had a strong black sharpie line between tim and myself that would give you a very easy column a column b and no, no room in between no air gaps to live inside does that make sense it does it just i guess i'm still wanting to ask the same question that a clean sharpie line would have been tim's character is saying crazy stuff and so i'm joining and saying crazy stuff and you are not so that is what you were doing even though you were you know humoring the character. I, I don't want angry parents. I, I would love for them to find their thing, whatever it is. I don't believe it's magical, but I mean, I'm a manager of a restaurant. I don't want a bad Yelp review. I don't want, I just, you know, we're closed and it's fine. People lose stuff. You know, it's, it's just the reality of that as, as a manager is I would like to help, but I have a feeling if this were to go on longer, you know, Tim would be just insisting, both insisting that we line up all the employees and go right down the line. Just like, that's ridiculous. Or we can't do that. And what I liked, it seemed like within the options of your character, like you just said, a standard restaurant manager is not going to just out and out say like, you're crazy. What you're saying is, is wrong. They're going to want to go along with it to see if I can find the thing and leave. But it seemed like on deck for things that could have happened in that scene were finally, if I won't leave, saying like, so you're really telling me your daughter's IQ triples with this? Like, that seems ridiculous. I also thought it could be as, as the dad gets more desperate. It could be, look, can you just make another doll out of something? Like, maybe <laughs> I don't believe it either, but I'm like, we got to maintain the status quo somehow. Can you give me something else? Maybe that way, but we never needed it. So as a way of closing this out, I'm trying to relate this back to miracles, which, you know, of course, we like to cross the streams that in you know, whatever we're talking about improv, then we're not necessarily talking about the lines of fantasy versus science. We're talking about the lines of what has been admitted within the scene as the believable body of opinion. And that we could have a completely absurdist scene in which you could still have, as we did in our first scene, you end up not believing me about the gold. I thought, whether my character thought, now we've entered this realm that miracles are acceptable, so why aren't you buying my bullshit? So some interesting, at least, dynamics there that it makes it seem like what counts as a miracle is going to vary with regard to the hypothesis, the overall worldview that you've agreed on in a particular setting. Yeah, one person's Jesus-shaped potato chip is another person's potato chip. In a country where all potato chips are Jesus-shaped, then a uh, Jesus-shaped potato chip with a mustache is just a potato chip with a mustache. I was going to say that the one potato chip where the Jesus has a mustache is, is king. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah. If it's a good push broom mustache as opposed to just a little pencil thin, there's your great schism right there. There's your Catholics and, and Protestants right there. Can we uh, reveal anything that is left to reveal 
I felt like the improv lesson, you were very straightforward with this is what we're doing. And that the conclusion is that a way of simplifying thing is to have a limited number of points of view. Was that the lesson? Yeah. And maybe we'll go deeper in other opportunities. But yes, is that looking at scenes as points of view and those points of view colliding. What is a point of view? And a point of view doesn't necessarily, oh, well, this maybe we'll save this. But some people in the greater improv world, the point of view might be, well, they, they just love reading a book in the rain. Well, you know, so did Stalin and Mother Teresa. That's not really helpful. A point of view is in this moment right now, what am I trying to achieve? What am I trying to accomplish? What's, what's driving this person? I'm regular restaurant manager trying to be helpful yet diligent in getting these people out of the, out of the restaurant. That, that's my point of view. Tim's point of view is I got to find my kid's doll. So point of view, look at any book about writing or improv. This Everyone's got their own little pet definition and our, our improv definitions are going to be different than a, our author's definition. And they all just need to be very much easily workable in the moment because I'm creating this thing right now. So I need a definition that's portable and easy to, to use. Tim, do you have anything to add to that from your own experience and thinking about this? Well, it's funny. Just hearing that reminds me of, I know I like puzzled over. I was one of those improv students that kind of puzzled over the rules. I would go home and for a, a few like naive early years would kind of try to come up with like equations or things to keep in my head to walk into any scene that would almost like prepare you for whatever's going to come your way. And after a while, I realized you can't hold that many things in the front of your mind while also walking on stage and doing a good scene. But I also came to realize point of view, I think when I had it as this like magical thing that could help instead of just how you feel about what's happening right now was a nice turning point where I was like, it's not this faraway thing that you go and find that like shields you against the dragon of the scene. You already have it. You just have to be conscious that you feel a certain way about what's going on right now. I mean, when we began that scene, Bill just came to me with a you know very straightforward situation, but it felt like within three lines, it was like, I believe this, Bill does not, but he's going to be helpful, grudgingly helpful. And that was having that point of view just allowed everything else. So it was, I love boiling down point of view is not a mystical, intricate thing that you have to construct, you know, in the back of your mind while the scene's happening. It's just your take on what's happening right now and something that you can return to if you find the scene maybe like fluttering a little bit. Big agreement with Bill's <laughs> lesson. Wow, I wonder how the judge is going to vote this week, <laughs> Mark. This is so biased, uh, but, but please, Mark, let's hear your little lesson. Well, you tell me what you got out of this whole talk of, I asked you earlier, sort of how do you react to the first scene regarding miracles and the direction Tim is going in terms of the uh, effect they have on individuals. And I've kind of made a few points in there. Bill, can you sort of distill what you think the thing that I came in wanting to? <laughs> Maybe that miracles are context dependent, perhaps, or we have to look at who the miracle happened to and the world around the miracle person. I was still waiting on the opinions of the ancients, but. <laughs> so the thing that complicated this, the thing that I kind of came in with was David Hume on miracles, where I kind of said in the first scene what his view was, which is that even if you were to witness something crazy, like you weigh that against the entirety <laughs> of the foundation of the consistency, and it would just rule it out. It would just as it actually does. When you see something anomalous, you're like, well, of course, that was a stage magic. Of course, that was video magic. And the, the thing he focused on is testimony, right? It, because he was concerned with like, should we care about the miracles taught to us from the Bible? And so, yeah, you know, everything we were dealing with and what made most sense for a scene, and I knew this was going to be in the case coming in, had to do with us experiencing in first person a miracle. But if anybody just came in and told you about this miraculous thing that happened, like clearly they're lying or fooling themselves. So that is, if we're going to actually weigh, do we think that Jesus actually rose from the dead? You know, this is the kind of thing he would say that we just have no choice. We could not possibly believe such a thing because we rate the reliability of testimony, which can be true or false. It's in general true. Mostly people telling us the stuff that, you know, actually happened to them versus the entire foundation of causality that we have witnessed, you know, and the patterns that, and so if we think that somebody's story about the sun standing still for a while, how much would everything else have to shift? In this case, context does get at it because it's the context of the web of other beliefs that we have. How much would everything else have to shift 
to admit this one thing of the sun standing still for a while. How did the Pope feel about Mr. Hume? Uh, I mean, he was reviled as an atheist, despite his protestations to the contrary, unsurprisingly. (laughs) Okay. As you would expect in the 18th century, yeah. Tim, I haven't unplugged JudgeBot. It's been here. It's sort of steaming away. But I explained to the JudgeBot beforehand that he would not be taking part in this. Tim, you are going to decide which lesson had the most profound effects on our listeners, on, on the people here. Yes. Shut JudgeBot down. We won't be needing it today. I have witnessed these proceedings with great attention, even while participating in them. And I may have an 11th hour shocker, considering which way you have surmised I might be leaning. Because as I think about one way to manage uh, multi-person scenes is by refining points of view. As I think about it, I think if one person knows that, they can kind of manage a scene. So while it was important to think about today, the fact that the presence of miracles and the context that people bring to them does make for some really interesting scenes. And I think gives you more DNA to begin with, like who believes what. And it's not only the miracle, it's how people react to it. And the system of beliefs that they think may support it or not support it seems like fertile ground for improvisation. So I I'm going to crown that lesson. Um, I, I, I <laughs> oh, mean, a third I, I, lesson. A third lesson. <laughs> no, no, no. This counts as the philosophy. That, that's, that the, is that the philosophy? Yes. I mean, the philosophy as it showed up today, which was in scenes. So, Bill, that counts. I came to this dance with you, Bill, but I think I'm leaving on the arm of Mark. Wow. I can't wait, Mark, for you to invite a philosophy person as a guest. And then they can feel guilty about being your friend and vote against you. Well, and probably if they don't know, I I want to see that moment as well. If they don't know anything about improv at all, then probably anything you say will be of profound effect to them. So I don't know if the person you invite, that means that it's going to give your side an advantage. I don't think that's actually going to be the case. Take your victory. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Tim, for joining us. It was my pleasure. Super fun, man. Great seeing you again. You too. Do you have just a a minute to sort of fill us in, Tim, on sort of what are your projects now? Where can people see you? Yeah, sure. I'm a writer on the Showtime show Work in Progress, which is a show strongly featuring Chicago improv mainstay Abby McEnany. And uh, it's in our second season. The episodes are being released right now. The other thing I uh, often do is I provide voiceover and writing for Hello from the Magic Tavern, another podcast. And I also do voiceover writing, some animation even for Jackbox Games, which are these social party games that have been popular during this time we live in of people having a lot of time at home. They're games that uh, we like to think almost anyone can play. You only need a phone. They have a new party pack they're called a party pack eight is coming out october 14th if people want to look for it in stores yeah those are all great things work in progress and jackbox and magic tavern all fantastic things and we should say tim is the the one that connected us i don't know what i I don't know if i want to say introduced because i knew of bill from his podcast from my ears but i also knew tim that same way tim had been on one of my other podcasts i felt comfortable reaching out to him I actually asked him if he wanted to do this. I think, do you want to do this or do you know someone? (laughs) I think I said, I don't know that I can bring the chops that you're describing, but I know someone who can. There you go. Oh, nice little hug on the tail uh, (laughs) or (laughs) something pleasant at the end. Yes, exactly. The wink emoji after the breakup. (laughs) (laughs) I enjoyed learning from you today, Bill. And I enjoyed learning from you, Mark and Tim. I enjoyed watching you both learn from each other. And scene. Hope you enjoyed the show. Get more at philosophyimprov.com. If you want to support the show and not have to hear any more commercials and get our post-game segments where Bill and I and sometimes guests will elaborate on some things that came up in the episode, reflect on the future, and share our recommendations in the philosophy and comedy worlds, you can see options to do that at philosophyimprov.com slash support. Thanks. Baby, I should sell my soul. I wrote. I wrote.